Welcome to our worship service here at St. Paul's United Church, where we in this area on the shores of Georgian Bay have just had torrential downfall. I was going to build an ark. It has rained and rained. Today is actually Thursday, uh, September the 23rd, as we're recording. I, I, yeah, like I wondered, I, I, this is, must be how Noah felt. You know? like, it just never stopped it's raining. True. It never and I'm stopped. sure there's been flooding somewhere yep. in the area because yeah. it was just so. I hear down much. around London, Middlesex County, there's yep. some flooding. Some and more I'm sure flooding. Other as well. So, anyhow, when you're watching this on Sunday, it might very well be high and dry, but it, uh, we went from shorts and t shirts right? to a long exactly. winter kind of yes, stuff in a overnight, hurry. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we are uh, super uh, delighted that you are here. And if you're a part of the St. Paul's congregation and you've already received your update, you will know that this week has bringing about some major changes for us. The transition steering team heard from the congregation 86 percent response to the survey. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone who shared with us what you were, uh, your thoughts are about uh, the slow reopening of our building. Uh, the church has been open all along. Um, <laughs> And, and giving us some feedback on what you would find helpful. So uh, much appreciated. Um, a number of comments, uh, in fact, a significant number of comments, um, made a point of thanking the staff and the uh, leaders who are behind the scenes, uh, our, our lay leaders who've been very much part of keeping St. Paul's and our work and our ministry alive and well. And But on behalf of the staff, I, I want to thank Thank you that you uh, for your comments and your appreciation for the work that we've done. It has and, been long, and the tech team as well. Yeah, absolutely, the tech team and uh, and uh, and members of the leadership team were also mentioned uh, from the congregation. So, yes. uh, thank you. Very how lovely much. to have yeah. words it of is. gratitude. Um, we've all put in. Um, a lot of extra hours, but that was okay. That's what you do in a pandemic. <laughs> but it has felt a little a little isolated, right? It, I mean, we have our, our small core group, but it's really nice to hear that it's appreciated. Yeah, thank so you. thank you so much for that. Um, Victoria is also on the transition steering team. Uh, it's dun, dun, uh, dun. That started as a team of eight, and now I think there are 11 uh, on that team, and they are the uh, decision makers and recommending bodies to the official board as we transition through this uh, pandemic. And so I'm going to go over to Victoria and she's going to give you an update. And uh, for if you have received the weekly update, it's all in that material. Right. She's just going to give you a synopsis. Right, exactly. So, super short synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to get on to the service. Uh, so a, a soft opening, as you mentioned, and uh, some small groups are now coming back into the church. Um, to meet, to do their thing. Um, might I mention off the top the bells? <laughs> the handbells were back uh, this week, um, distanced, masked. We wear gloves anyway, so that works. Um, and, and doing some ringing again, and they're just delighted to be back together. Um, Bible study. Bible study starting up okay. at the end of September. Um, this, the scouts are coming back. Um, so some, some yeah, groups are UCW's coming back in. Yeah, the UCW is hoping to well, have a meeting. Well, that's where yeah. I was going next. Yeah, so UCW, which brings us to pies, uh -huh. right? <laughs> because they're yeah. doing another one of their pie sales. Um, and there will be more detail on that. And there's some detail in the, um, in the update. But they're looking yeah. for bakers, I understand. Yeah. So got to love that. Um, but all of that to say that we are working toward um, putting in place volunteers and cleaning and protocol around bringing people in on the 24th of October. Yay, we have a date. That's we our have target. A time, mark it. Barring unforeseen disasters in the meantime. Yes, so, called 24th uh, of October. <laughs> um, there will be information forthcoming on pre registering. Mostly because, you know, we just don't want somebody to get up in the morning and dressed and out to church and come to the door and find out that we're at capacity because, of course, we'll be 
uh, yeah. limited. In we our are numbers. mandated to be socially distant, and uh, we think at this point maybe 40, and mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes, mm -hmm. and we may be able to increase yeah. that. But beginning with about yeah. 40 people. Yeah. So anyway, more to come on that, more details around pre-registering. Yeah, right. thank you for that. Okay. Uh, as we said, more details in your weekly update. Mm -hmm. um, if it is before 11 o'clock and you are watching this Sunday morning, <laughs> at 11, we have our coffee hour by Zoom. And we're really hoping a lot of you folk will be able to come on. And we have some decisions uh, to make as a, a, as a group on that Zoom call on how we'll proceed once we're back uh, in person and online, because not everyone's coming back. Some are choosing to stay online mm -hmm. uh, for worship. So uh, hoping you'll come on to that Zoom call as because well. Because the calls are at 11. Because the calls 10, are at 11. Right? So. And we're still here. Right? <laughs> so if you want to get home to be on the Zoom call, then yes. we need to shift the time. Exactly. So. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Hey, we're a team. Exactly. <laughs> um, and the music today. Music. Um, did you notice the long list of singers <laughs> this morning? I was like, there are a lot of people listed there. Um, First of all, the f opening hymn, I did not know. I found, you know how you're on YouTube and you listen to that and it leads you to that and then over to that. I did not know this hymn before. It may be um, a very well-known hymn for some people, but it is, uh, there is sunshine in my soul today. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir um, are singing it. And the language, I do apologize, it's a little, it's not what we're accustomed to in the United Church. It's not, it's not inclusive. <laughs> But the tune struck me, and the pictures are so beautiful in it, and I, I just loved it, so I yeah. wanted to include it somehow. But the story behind it, I looked up, is um, a, a teacher in Pennsylvania had a back injury, was in a cast for six months. Her doctor finally said to her on a summer day, sunny summer day, um, okay, I think you're ready, you could go out and have a walk. And she was so moved by the beautiful sun and being able to walk again outside that she wrote... Oh, these wonderful words. story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought yeah. so as well. Um, then we have Sisters Let Us Walk Together. And this is sung by um, uh, Red Deer Lake United Church group of singers. Um, it's, it's not a virtual picture thing, or is it? No, it isn't. It's got <laughs> pictures and words. So sing along, but um, uh, kudos to them for, for putting that together. And it was readily available and happy to use it. And um, we're going to close with, go make a difference. We that is such a, a favorite in this church, isn't it? We <laughs> it love really that is. song. It really is. Yeah, and this yeah. version in particular is sung by the creators of said, go make a difference. Um, and it's super jazzy and hoping that you like it. Fabulous. Fabulous. My postlude, if anyone mm -hmm. cares. Oh, right. <laughs> is I called do. meditation. So you can all meditate when this is over on the, the reopening of St. Paul's. Uh, it's uh, composed by William Moore. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And with all of that, we indeed are worshiping together. And we are grateful for God and for this congregation and for the work and ministry of Jesus Christ that allows us to do this. And so we come before our God. Thanks be to God. And so tap your toes. There's sunshine in my soul today by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. If you figure out the tune and you know it, mm -hmm. sing along. Indeed.
Wasn't that lovely? I didn't know this piece either. Um, but there is sunshine in our souls, even when we're in the midst of all sorts of things. Let us pray. Holy One, as we come to worship you this day, we give you thanks and praise. We ask that you will indeed enable us to see glimpses of sunshine and hope in the midst of the ongoing things that just make it difficult some days. We pray that the hope, the sunshine of Jesus Christ will not only be in our personal lives, but in our community. And dare we hope around the world. Let us be a part of that as we worship you, as we come together, albeit virtually still, and worship. Amen. So coming up is our acknowledgement of the land, and then that will be followed with uh, one of our children. We still don't have them in person lighting our Christ candle, but they are sending in videos still. And then a sung response, and it's A Light is Gleaming, sung by Rebecca, and uh, so we will continue now with the acknowledgement of the land. I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat First Nations people, and that we seek to be in right relationship with Beausoleil First Nations. We have had a painful and tragic past. May we together work for a more wonderful, honoring, and dignity filled future. As we light this Christ candle, May it remind us that Christ is in us and yeah. in our world. Yeah. I love that piece. I've always loved that song, Living in the Light. And it's a wonderful follow-up to the sunshine piece that we heard initially. Today's scripture reading is really different. Um, I'm going to be talking and preaching from the lectionary, and it's the story of Esther, Queen Esther. Um, the pieces that they wanted us to read, you cannot understand or appreciate what they mean until you know the whole story. And so today's scripture reading is a synopsis of the 10 chapters of the book of Esther. I didn't think you wanted us to read all 10 chapters. So tonight, today is the day of synopsis. So let me begin by telling you about this ancient story. And this book is in the um, Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. And it is a bit of a puzzlement to most biblical scholars and is a bit controversial to others because it really doesn't fit into any of the categories of the biblical texts. It's a story that goes on for 10 chapters and not once is God mentioned. And so that's very different. That's the only book in the entire Bible where God is not even referred to. And so that creates a 
some consternation for some. I'm going to suggest to you that this is a story that talks about the presence of God in everyday living and in days of difficulty. It's also about the presence of God in how we as human beings struggle to live our faith and to follow the one who we call, for us as Christians, Christ, for those who were Jewish, as Esther was, their uh, Yahweh. And so hear this story, and if you don't know it, it's probably because it's very rarely ever used for sermons, which I think is sad because um, it does have its moments, and it's... uh, an interesting one. So let me start by telling you that there was once upon a time, although he really did exist, there was a king Azaris, and he ruled from what is modern day India to Ethiopia in a land called Susa. And so this was a real empire many, many, many generations ago. Now, King Azaris wanted to uh, invite all of the leaders of the community and from other nations uh, to come, and he held a banquet because he really wanted to show off his wealth and his power. And if you were to read the scripture, oh my word, there's marble, gold, you name it, they've got it. Everything was pulled out to impress whoever came to this banquet, which was actually 180 days. Whoa, I have never partied for 180 days straight, so you can imagine what it was like. And in the midst of that, at the very end, there was a very, very, very special banquet, and it was seven days. It would have been all of the leaders, all men at that time, and the king, and there were orders that are even recorded in the Bible about everybody can have as much to drink as they want. Alcohol in super abundance. So, on the seventh day, the last day of this banquet, the Bible says that the king was a little bit merry and drunk. And most of his guests are as well. And so the king, in his state and frame of mind, decides that his queen is extraordinarily beautiful. And she's always been hosting the women because women and men didn't mingle, especially in places of power. And so he orders his wife, his queen, to come to the banquet wearing only her crown. Now you can imagine how degrading that would be for any woman. And you can imagine how fearful she would be with a drunk husband and about 200 other drunk men in the room. To come like that was such a humiliation that she risked her own life and she refused to come. Now, of course, that led to the king being mightily angry. But it also led to great consternation among all of the men present. And in the days to come, they had to decide just what were they going to do with Queen Vashti? How dare she? How dare she? dare she refuse to come on an order of her king and of her husband? And then the other men started to worry. And it's all there in the Bible. Well, my goodness, if Queen Vasti isn't going to listen to the king, what about our wives? Well, we're just going to have to bring these women under control because we sure do not want them being like Queen Vasti and not following the directions and the orders of their husbands. And so a decree went out that all women must follow the commands of their husbands no matter what the request, the cost, or the consequences. Now, King Ashtar did love Queen Vashti, so he did not have her killed as she had risked, but he ordered her to be put away. You know, we think that stuff only happens a long time ago. 
But we live in a world where we all know that there is abuse in families, that there is marital violence, domestic violence, and women and children are indeed assaulted in their own homes. It's only in very recent years that the Russian government under Putin removed the laws from their land that said that it was illegal for a man to violently abuse his wife. Here in Canada, women are protected. It is against the law to abuse anyone, let alone your wife or your children. But in Russia, they removed that law. And all men can beat their wives and their children without impunity. They are free to do so. And there is no legal repercussion for the women. That's just happened in recent times. And so as I read these texts, I'm always reminded, oh my word, these are some of the things that are still being dealt with in our world today. And unfortunately for some of you, in your very homes, may God be with you and give you courage to face that. So when Vashti refuses, now they've got a problem because, you know, they've got this king and he really liked his very beautiful wife and now he's unhappy and so what are they going to do about it? So they decide that they are now going to go across all 127 provinces and they are going to look for all of the young, beautiful virgins And so that's what they do. They go out into the whole country and they start yanking young girls who are beautiful from their homes. Human trafficking is what we would call that here in Canada. So these young women are grabbed, snatched, taken away and they're brought to the king and they are forced into his harem to be the king's sexual playthings. There's no choice. They are brought willingly or not. And their future is dismal. And when you think that they picked up thousands of these women, it also means that there are now thousands of men who will never have a wife. Because there's now a tremendous shortage of women for men to marry. Now, there was a young woman, her name was Esther, and she was a Jew, and her parents had both died. She was orphaned, and so she was raised by a much older cousin who adopted her as his daughter. And she gets picked up. She's beautiful, she's young, she's a virgin, she's ripe meat, to put it quite bluntly. And she has no choice. And she's taken in with all of these other young women. And as a Jewish person, as many as some of the others may well have been Jewish as well, or other of ethnic backgrounds, she has now lost her identity, as they all did. She has lost her language. She has lost her culture. She has lost her religion. She has lost her family and her community. And she's now stuck in a harem with thousands of others to be a toy of the king. Well, sure enough, her time comes up and she's sent into the king. Now, for Esther, the king decides, "Mm, my, I've had a lot, I'm really liking this one, and keeps bringing her back, bringing her back, and finally decides that she will be his next queen. Meanwhile, Mordecai, her uncle, her cousin, has said to her, do not reveal that you are Jewish because they could kill you. Don't say a word. Walk away from that. So that's all well and good for Esther. But then, as people are greedy, and you know, we all know people who want to climb that ladder, male or female, it's a corporate ladder, and there's a place at the top, and in courts, and in governments, even here in Canada, there is that political scrambling. 
And a man named Haman really wants to get to be the top official. And he's greedy, and he's cunning, and he's ruthless, and he is vain on top of that. And so he begins to scheme, and he gets to the very highest position in the land. And he has the king decree that all people have to bow to him. Now, Mordecai, the queen's, they say, cousin, uncle in both Hebrew, he keeps checking in to see how his, how his adopted daughter is doing. And he refuses to bow to Haman. It's against his faith. It's against his religion. And Haman gets upset because Mordecai should be bowing to me. Everyone should. And power has gone so much to this man's head that he decides that he's going to punish Mordecai. In fact, he's going to have Mordecai hung. But it gets worse. He decides that, well, not only will I do that to Mordecai, I'm going to wipe out all of the Jews. And he goes to the king and he gets permission to do a genocide. So the decrees are being written up, everything's being prepared, and Haman is happy because very soon, right across the province, all of the Jews and their families will be massacred. And he will be able to claim what they have. And guess what? He's got the king in on it, and he's going to pay the king a really large amount of money because it's worth it to him to get rid of Mordecai and the Jews. Plan genocide. We know about that too. The Truth and Reconciliation called our treatment of the residential schools a genocide. People in Canada did not like that. Rwanda, genocide. Armenia, genocide. We have a history of genocide in our world going way back. So Mordecai appeals to his adopted daughter, Queen Esther who's unaware of this because she would have been, unless she was with the king, locked up with the rest of the harem. And she says to him, I can't do anything about it. You don't understand. The last month, the king hasn't been calling me. He's been checking out the rest of the harem again. And if I go to him and he hasn't called me, I and anyone else who attempts to do this is automatically killed. And her uncle says to her, well, Esther, if you think you're going to be able to hide that you're a Jew and you're going to save your own skin at the cost of the lives of everyone else, you better think twice about it because your very life could be in danger as well. Maybe, maybe you were there for a reason. So she prays and prays and prays. And three days later, she dresses in her best robes and she goes and she stands outside the king's court. And she knows that he just has to give the nod and she's immediately killed. But the king sees her and decides, oh, what the heck, I'll let her come in. So she's not killed. She invites him to a banquet with Haman. Then she invites him to a second banquet because she's trying to get him really in a good mood because she's got a huge request. And the king has been so delighted. He says, okay, ask me anything, anything you want, and it's yours up to half my kingdom. And she said, I just ask that you save my life. And he says, what? What do you mean save your life? She says, I just ask that you save my life because there's an evil, wicked person who's trying to take my life. The king says, what are you talking about? She says, I am a Jew. And the king realizes that he is the one who's agreed to Haman's plan. She says, not only is my life in danger, but all of my kin who is now in trouble? Haman. His greed, his vanity, his search and quest for power has made him so jealous and so corrupt that he's actually now destroyed all that he built up. The king gets angry, has Haman killed, the decree goes out, the Jews are saved. Queen Esther 
the heroine of the day. She's just, she saved her people. Now, wouldn't it be lovely, absolutely delightful, if the book ended at that? But here's the horrible crunch. The horrible crunch is that Esther and Mordecai then take their revenge on their enemies. And the king decrees that the Jews can kill their enemies and about 80,000 people later are dead. It's like, couldn't you have ended the story a little bit earlier? Because that part of the scripture story is awful and demoralizing. So, Karen, why would you tell this story? I know you're thinking it. I know, I know you're thinking it. Well, not only is it a scripture story, but I tell it because it speaks so much of so many things. It speaks of how sometimes we want to hide and run away from our identity. And sometimes a simulation means that we don't have to claim who we really are. And we certainly know about that in our treatment of First Nations people, not only here in Canada, but in other countries as well. It speaks about a woman who had courage to risk her own life for the sake of others. And I think of Gandhi, and I think of Martin Luther King Jr., and I think of those who have the courage to even speak up, even now in, in places where someone is being abused. Have you ever stood in, in the grocery store and had someone yip yammering away at the clerk ahead of them because they're not fast enough? Or, or you stand behind a line at Service Canada or someone's mad or, oh, good Lord, we can even go more recently. We can even go to the protests that have been happening in front of our hospitals. It's one thing to have a peaceful protest. It is a whole other thing to harass and abuse others. And everyone who takes a stand against that takes a stand for what they believe in the goodness and the sake of others. What courage, what boldness, what cunning she had and yet, it also points to the fact that we are all so human. We all are going to make our mistakes. We all have that little piece within us that's jealous, that piece that seeks for power, that piece that wants others to think more of us, that piece within us that wants revenge. Absolutely, it's, it's part of being human. And this story is as much about being human and struggling on how we live within ourselves and have those struggles within us as well as how they play out in systemic injustice in the way governments run. We are blessed that we can at least get rid of our governments in elections. Many countries can't. But we also have a responsibility to speak out against the things that we believe are not in the good and interest of all, not just ourselves. It's a dual sword to be a citizen in a democratic country. And I'll tell you, it's a dual sword to be a Christian who follows the path of Jesus Christ and seeks with all of our flaws, our warts, our bumps, our shadow side of who we are, we all struggle with that. It's real. We're called human beings. And in the midst of that, to remember that there's the gifts of who we are as well. There's the laughter. There's the joy. There's the wisdom. There is the experiences that we know and bring that give us insight. And we draw upon that. There's our faith, there's teachings, there's the way my mama taught me and the things my father modeled, but there's things that our educational system has given us as well. There are those people who've mentored us and they come before us and there's even more. In the midst of all the things we don't like about ourselves, 
there's the strength and courage that we have and can draw upon to move ourselves into a place where we know that we are honoring who we are. And in doing so, we honor God and others. You see, when you read stories like this in the Bible, I really invite you to sit and ponder and say, what is the story here? And how do I see this affecting my life? And then take it a step further. And what do I see in these scriptures that I'm also seeing in the world? You know, it's a story of fighting racism and greed and corruption. It's a story of abuse of power, which can happen to so many. Power does corrupt. You can get feeling pretty vain and pretty jealous. But it's also a story of goodness and grace and courage in the face of disaster, even genocide. So may you ponder this. And may you have the courage to look within yourself for all the gifts of God's grace and goodness and joy and laughter and strength and vibrancy and courage. May you recognize the things that you're not really so happy about with yourself and work through that so that at the end of the day, you can be all that you can be. And you might even be able to make a difference in the world. I want to thank you so much for the gifts that you give to St. Paul's United Church and to so many other organizations that have at their heart the well-being of others. And with that, We chose a new song. I don't know this one as well. It comes from our More Voices, but we thought it was really fitting with this scripture. It's called Sisters Let Us Walk Together. It's from More Voices 179, and that's from that Red Deer Lake Singers. Thank you to that United Church. Sisters let us walk together Hi, my name is Juliana Shaw, and I will be doing the prayers of the people today. Please join me at the close of the prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Holy One, God of us all, we pause to pray and to open ourselves to stillness. Be with us. As Esther felt helpless as she and her people faced threat, abuse, and death, help us to know that even when we feel helpless, that you are with us. Help us to seek the resources within and around us to work for the good of others. May we face the threats that seek to destroy us. Grant us wisdom, not for ourselves, but for the lives of all people. We have enjoyed the summer and being able to once again connect with others. We are grateful for vaccines and those who have worked so long and hard to keep us safe. As the Delta variant of COVID continues to threaten our health and safety, 
Grant us compassion to live in ways that seek the well-being of others. As our church works to reopen our building and we continue to do the work and ministry of Jesus Christ in the midst of these difficult times, may we open to your call to follow you. Guide us. May your teachings of radical love and hospitality be reflected in all we do. Be with all people and nations, individuals and governments. Be with those who live with trauma, despair, and hopelessness. May we be part of making a difference in the world so that we and others may know love, laughter, joy, justice, and hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is a favorite here in our congregation, Go Make a Difference. Hope you enjoy it.
Let's change the world for the betterment of all. Let's put into practice God's love and compassion for the environment as well as all people. Let's make a difference in the way in which we live our faith. Have the courage of Esther. Have the wisdom of God. And have ourselves and our faith community here and around the world to be the light of Christ to the world and to make that difference. Sure people, even if they remember it, won't go, you played that already. <laughs> 